Hi, it's good to be with you all on the last night of the Passion Conference. I've been having a great time here, uh, not only preaching here, but spending time with, with Pastor Young. And uh, I trust that God is going to speak and, and bless us tonight as well. But before I, I get into the actual message of tonight, I was thinking, um, I wanted to just show a few slides about our church in Silicon Valley, Renewal. I was thinking, oh, I should have probably done that the first night and kind of intro a little bit, but um, better late than never. Just so you know where I'm coming from and also one of the newest, actually the newest church plant in our network of churches, Acts Ministries International. And I can, I can claim that title until the Taipei church plant officially launches in February. Okay, so I, I'm holding on to these last three or four months of being the newest church plant in, in AMI. But uh, our church is called Renewal Church, and the, that logo is actually designed by Henderson, former GCC. See, GCC is just contributing so much to, to our church. We're so, so thankful for all the, the co-laborers and the workers that we have. Our church is uh, located in, in the Bay Area. Now, so, just to give you kind of an idea of the geography, I'm a New Yorker. I had no idea where anything in the Bay Area was. When I got there, I had no clue. So this is the peninsula here, and this is San Francisco over here. And this red star is Radiance Church, an AMI church. Yes, it's literally that large. It covers 85% of San Francisco. I don't know exactly where it is. It's there somewhere. And this is San Francisco. That's the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, all that kind of stuff up here. Our church, Renewal Church, is down here. Okay, So this is like 45 minutes without traffic, an hour and a half with traffic up there. So we are really far. We're actually closer to San Jose than we are to San Francisco. Um, the 49ers play over here. Uh, this is where we are in the city of Sunnyvale. So a lot of times people will be like, oh, Ulysses, I'm going to come visit you in San Francisco. Oh, Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, fun. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> you, you don't want to visit me. Down here you will see houses. You will see large buildings. Uh, with uh, companies on them like Facebook and Apple. You'll see all that stuff, but no Golden Gate Bridge, none of that stuff. You don't want to visit me. You want to visit Pastor Mark and other people. But what, what you will see are, are big companies. Facebook is headquartered down there. Apple is down there. Amazon has a presence. I know their headquarters in Seattle, but they have a presence. Netflix, Google. So uh, massive, massive tech companies are there, and lots of the people in our church actually work in these different companies. If you come visit us, I will try to get you into Facebook to, for lunch and take pictures and their version of downtown Disney and all that kind of stuff. It's a crazy place. Uh, but it, it's, an, it's a very interesting place, and, and it is such an unreached area, actually. The, the number of churches there and the pop, percentage of the population that goes to church or uh, has gone to church is, is really, really low. So actually, there is a boom in church planting there. A lot of churches are planted there now, but a lot fail. It's a very difficult place to do church. A spiritual environment is very difficult. And uh, it's very expensive. It's a difficult place to do ministry. So lots of churches are needed. So Renewal Church started actually with a, uh, a cell group out of Radiance Church. So Renewal is, is the brainchild, is the vision of Radiance Church, of, of Pastor Mark and the leaders there and the congregation there, and AMI's commitment to church planting. And they had a small group all the way down near where my red arrow was, where we were for church. And these people were driving up on Sundays like an hour to get to church, and they were so committed because they were filled with GCC people and other people like that who were like, I don't want to be in an AMI church, and they're driving up to the city. So they had this vision to start a church down there. So this is um, some of the people from our initial small group, uh, and some of them are still there, some aren't, but it was a small group from Radiance Church, and I'm so thankful for Pastor Mark and for, for their vision to do this and inviting me to be able to be a part of it. Without them... Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So this uh, small group, we started meeting um, semi-officially as a church in July of last year. And in July of last year, we started having afternoon services, 4 o'clock on Sundays, at this place called Taekwon Kids. It's a Taekwondo studio. Such a blessing. The owner is a devout Christian. Devout Christian. He takes his Taekwondo students on mission trips. Non-believing, believing, it doesn't matter. Their vision statement says, we exist to serve God. Crazy, crazy, crazy guy. And 
You know, one of those guys, he said to me, this is God's house. This is God's business. So who am I to not let you meet there? I was like, yeah, who are you to not let me meet here? <laughs> and for free, for free on top of that. So God just really blessed us as a new church plant, worried about finances, all that kind of stuff. Um, to find a place to meet was such a blessing. And we, you know, like, I, w I was there, I was like, oh, you know, we want to be a church for all people. So I was like, man, I, you know, I know our group is predominantly uh, Asian American. Hopefully we can do all that we can to not be that Asian. And then we start meeting at this Taekwondo studio. And then, not only that, because of the mats, we have to take off our shoes. <laughs> there goes that. We're more Asian than a church in Asia because of that. No, but we are, we're about a 10% non-Asian, non, non which I'm really, really thankful for. Our neighborhood where we planted a church is predominantly Indian, so we're hoping to reach out to our neighbors there. Uh, we have an Indian couple in our church, so we're very, very excited about that. So we, we started off there at Taekwondo Kids in July of last year, and then we found a home here. This is where we meet. We are in the town, city of Sunnyvale. They call them cities. As a New Yorker, I laugh at that. <laughs> it's called a borough. It's called a town, but they call it a city. But that's okay. So we're in the city of, city of Sunnyvale, and we meet at the Sunnyvale Community Center. Here's Mountain View, and uh, Cupertino's down here. The Apple spaceship is over here. Uh, it, we're, we're right smack dab in the middle of, of Silicon Valley and all these different tech companies. And when I got there, I thought that I was going to have a church full of old people like me. You know, people with kids, and it's the burbs. It's not San Francisco. But we had a church filled with millennials right away because I discovered that many people who work at the companies down here don't want to commute from San Francisco, and I don't blame them. So our, our church was, was filled with millennials from the very beginning, and we meet, uh, this is the Sunnyvale Community Center, we meet right here in, in the Senior Center in a room called the Orchard Pavilion, and it's a really, really nice uh, facility, we're really thankful for it, it's got this little pond right outside that they dye Kool-Aid blue. It's Kool-Aid blue. It's very unnatural. I thought about doing baptisms in there for a second, but I said, it doesn't look safe. You know, sometimes it just doesn't look right. No, let's, let's skip that. So um, it, it's, a, it's a really, really great facility. This is the room that we meet in, in, in the Orchard Pavilion. This is uh, one of the guys who works there. His name is Jesus, and I told him to stand there just so I can get scale in the picture. But once I found out his name was Jesus, I said, this is the spot. This is the spot. We have to rent this. I mean, Jesus is already here. What else could I ask for? This is, this is, this is where we got to be. This is where we got to be. So three months later, in October, we moved in and we had our official launch service. So this was in October. Um, you know, in, in the room, we had a lot of people come out and support us. And, and uh, you know, it, it was really, really wonderful. We had a lunch and all that kind of stuff. And we started off pretty strong with about 50 people or so. Lots of people from, from Radiance and, and some people who maybe were from Radiance and, you know, um, wanted to kind of just see and, and check us out. And, and so we started off pretty strong because of that. And just to highlight a few things that have happened during the year, really excited about a few baptisms uh, that we've had. This one was in the Pacific Ocean, and I almost lost this one over here. It was very cold, it was very rough, and it was almost like I baptized you and you are gone. It was, it, that you could, it was, it was rough. It was rough that day. Uh, but we, we've done it different ways. Really, really excited to see people get baptized in our church. And it's freezing in the Pacific. I don't know what we're going to do. We're still trying to figure out how we're going to baptize in the future. Um, our, our kids' ministry has been growing. We have about like 15 to 20 uh, kids, toddlers, babies. We are really excited. We have three kids now in middle school, so we're like starting a middle school meeting. Uh, they've been doing that on, on uh, weekday nights. We had two girls. Now we have a boy. We're like, oh my God, we have a boy. And now we've got to kind of do things differently and really excited. This weekend we're having a meeting about that to, to plan for it. We also had our first... Uh, renewal, renewal retreat a couple of weeks ago at a place in, uh, in, in, the, in the mountains, the Redwoods over there, and it was, it was great. We really, really well attended. We had about 90-something people come out, which is like 75, 80% of our church, so it was really, really a blessing. And then this was uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is our uh, one-year anniversary service, and, you know, I told everybody to smile, and, of course, in every church, no one sits in the front, right? It's just, no one sits in the front. Look, right here, no one, 
no one. Okay, over here, worship team. Must be worship team. And, um, you know, so the church is, is, you know, for all that I, I share about, like, it's been the hardest year of my life, and that's all because that's on me. That's my insecurities, my fears, and all that stuff. God has been so gracious to our church. We've been growing a lot and uh, just trying to figure out how to do healthy church and how to, uh, you know, we learn a lot from you guys, from GCC, and we're so blessed by all the, the GCC support that we have and the, the G GCC people that we have all over our church in, in different places. So that, that's our church, and if you're ever in Silicon Valley, if you're in the Bay Area, please, please come visit us. If you're up in SF, Radiance is there waiting for you. If you're down in the South Bay, we are there waiting for you. And uh, please pray for us. Please pray for us. We are, we're real busy right now, but, but it's really, really good. So that's just a little bit about our church and what we've been doing. Uh, tonight, uh, what I want to share for this last night of the, the Passion Meeting is I, I want to share about how dangerous it is to be uh, presumptuous and how being presumptuous can really get us in a lot of trouble. Uh, exhibit A, when I went after my wife, when I realized that she was the one that, that, I, that I wanted, that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, I, I, I was very, very confident when I went to ask her out. When, when I asked her, I, I said, hey, can we meet up for, for coffee? And, you know, she was like, why do you want to meet up with me for coffee? I said, I just want to meet up with you for coffee. Later on, she told me, I thought you were going to rebuke me. I said, no, no, my dear, the exact opposite, the exact opposite, right? No, not, not at all. Why do, you, why do you think it's rebuke? No, total opposite. It was love. It was love. So I said, I, you know, I went in very confident into that meeting because I was so sure I saw all these signs from her that she was into me. And you know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I, was, I, was, I was so sure. You know, like, you know, like the, you notice the, the hair flick a little more often around you? You know, like, ladies come, we know, when we, when you, when we walk close and you do the hair flick, it's, it's like an automatic thing, right? I, I know I saw the hair flick a little more from her. Now GCC girls going to be, I'm flicking my hair any, <laughs> anywhere, you know, like, <laughs> can you flick my hair for me, right? I'm not going to, and I, I, I saw, I saw these, these looks and these gazes that just seemed a little longer than from other people. Like, you know, like, do you have something to say to me? Like, you know, like the longer kind of look. And I was like, man, this girl is into me. Yes, it's going to be easy. It's going to be slam dunk. God, you brought her to me. I, I want to marry this girl. I know she's the one. And so I, I took her out to coffee, and we were sitting in the diner. And then she's like, you know, oh, getting ready to get rebuked, right? And I'm there, and I'm just a little nervous, but I'm like, I got this. I got this. Come on, coach. I'm open right here. And I, I said, and I, I was talking to her, I started telling her about my feelings for her and, and that I liked her. I was, hey, I was straight up. I did it right. I did it right. No beating around the bush. No, uh, you want to hang out 15 times in a row for no apparent reason, right? I was, I did it right. I like you. With a little more, a little more suave and a little more finesse than that. But basically, I came straight out. I said, I, I like you. I put it all on the line. Granted, I thought she was more into me than I was into her. But then I, I told her, I like you, you know, I, and I, I want to date you. And then she begins to cry. <laughs> she begins to weep. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all so overwhelming, isn't it? <laughs> When your wildest dreams come true, I would cry too if I were you. She started weeping and crying, and then after this weeping and crying goes on for a while, and it's really intense. And I'm like, whoa, hey, I, I told you I like you. Like, hey, calm down. And then, I, and then I started to have some doubts. I was like, this is a real painful kind of sobbing. I was like, what, what's, what's going on here? And then, and then as I'm looking at her, as I'm talking to her, and then she begins to cry, and she's like, oh, you, 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 you don't understand, you know, I just came out of a, 
bad relationship and I've been really hurt and, and I don't know and, and all this kind of stuff. And then my heart just sank. And I was like, oh my gosh. How could anyone get something so wrong? But by the grace of God, I salvaged that. I salvaged it. I, salvaged it. I was patient. I played the long game. Told her I am love, I am peace, I am all those things. And eventually, here we are married. Honey, if you're watching on live stream, hello. Hello. Very self conscious right now. I don't know if she's watching. She could be, she might not be. Anyways, uh, being presumptuous can, can get you into a lot of trouble. Can get you into a lot of trouble. And that, that's what I want to talk to you, us about, uh, to, to all of us tonight uh, about is that I believe that sometimes in our, in our relationship with God, too, we can be very presumptuous. We can be presumptuous. We could take things for granted. We could think our relationship is a certain way, when in fact, it really isn't. And reality is different from what we think. Once Adam and Eve left the garden, once sin entered the world, we look at what happens, and, and right away, with Cain and Abel, from them bringing their offerings, and Abel's being accepted, and Cain's being rejected, down to Jesus' day, to the Pharisees, whom he said, worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That worship is unacceptable. We realize, when we look at the Bible, that we can no longer presume that what we bring to God is always acceptable. We dare not be presumptuous about what we bring to God. Now, here's a question, a thought experiment. Could it be possible, what if the, the offerings, what we have been bringing to God, what you and I have been bringing to God, have not been accepted by Him? What if some of the things were, but some of the things weren't? But all along, we thought that whatever we brought to him was acceptable to God. I believe that the Bible teaches us that we need to be very careful and thoughtful and not presumptuous about what we bring to God in worship, what we bring to God as an offering. And, and I want to read from Malachi chapter 1 tonight, verses 6 to the end of the chapter, 6 through 14. That's our passage for tonight. It says this. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, O priest who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame, or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the chief who has a male in his flock, and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Let's pray. 
Oh Lord, you are a great, great king. And may this room tonight be filled with reverence for your awesome name. Would you instill within our hearts, would you refresh our hearts once again to be reminded of the glory of God, of the regal nature of our King, of the majesty of our Lord, that we would honor you as great in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in Malachi here, what, what, what was happening? Let me set the stage a little bit here. In ancient Israel, in the Old Testament system, when people came to worship God, when they came to give offering to God, what they would generally do is that they would bring an animal, a goat, a bull, a dove, something like that. And now God had very, very uh, specific qualifications for the types of offerings that people were supposed to bring. They had to bring them in a certain way. They had to be prepared a certain way. They had to approach God with great care and diligence. And they had to present an offering that was pleasing to God. Now, the offering, the way it's described in the Bible, is that the offering should be perfect. Perfect. Like a one-year-old male lamb, without blemish, without any types of issues. The perfect blue ribbon lamb that you have. That's what you're supposed to come and bring and offer to God. Because God is great, because he deserves the very best. Now, what happened one day, for example, with uh, Israelite Bob, was that Bob needed to go up to Jerusalem. It's, I know it's not a very Israelite-like name, but Bob it needs to go to Jerusalem. He needs to present an offering to God. And he's out there walking around the market trying to pick a, a sheep to bring. Now, every year that he's gone, he's brought a, a perfect male lamb, and he's gone and given that offering. But this year, when he's walking around the market, he looks and he sees this lamb in the side and it says, on sale, on sale, the sale section. And he walks over and he looks at that lamb and he goes, hey, this lamb is 50% off. Why? Why is this lamb on sale? And the guy goes, hey, this is a great lamb. Fantastic. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it except it has a slight blemish on its backside under its left hip and you, you won't even notice it it's hardly anything but how come nobody's buying well you know it's kind of offering time and all that kind of stuff and you know it's got to be a perfect offering and all that kind of thing but you know, if you go look you, you can hardly even see it really 50 percent off that's a steal that's a discount and bob's there looking at this sheep he's like, oh wow 50 percent off Man, if I bought this lamb instead, oh my gosh, think about how much other stuff I could buy. Think about how much other food I could eat. Think about all the money that I could save. And he goes over and he looks at this lamb and he looks at the back left leg and he's like, oh, I see that a little bit. It's got a little bald spot over there and a little scar and a little blemish. But it's so small. Who will really notice? I wonder, would God notice? Would God care? 50% off? All right, let's give it a try. So he says, I'll take it. He pays the shekels for the lamb, the, the gold, the silver for the lamb, and he takes it, and he brings it over to the priest. And now the priest is, is looking at this offering, looks at it, looks good to him. He doesn't notice that blemish because it's, it's so small in the back. But Bob knows it's there. Bob knows it's there. And then as he's looking at this priest preparing this offering, Bob begins to get nervous. Oh, the priest doesn't know that blemish is there. But I know that blemish is there. And guess who else knows that blemish is there? God knows that blemish is there. Oh, maybe I made a bad decision here. What if I offer this to God and he sees that and then God is so angry at me. And all of a sudden, dark storm clouds come and cover the altar area, and it begins to lightning and thunder. And then all, all of a sudden, all the people run, and I'm standing there, and this lightning bolt comes out of heaven and comes and hits me and fries me, kills me, because I offered this blemished offering to God. What if that happens? So now Bob's like nervous. So he's like, oh, I, I think I did. Maybe I should abort. Maybe I should go back. And, oh, those two ladies are already cutting it. And all this. He's bringing it to the altar. Oh, no. What have I done? God's going to kill me. And the earth is going to open up and swallow me up and my whole family. Oh. And the 
priest is there, and he takes that offering, and he puts it on the altar, and he lights that fire, and burns it, and offers it to God, and Bob is there, like, shaking, like, like, peeing in his pants, this whole time this thing is being burned, the priest's like, what's wrong with this guy, he's like, I'm just a nervous guy, right, and then Bob is watching, and then the smoke goes up, uh oh, uh oh, the smoke, that's when the Bible says that God will smell and go, oh, that's good stuff, right? oh no, he's going to smell and go, ah, 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 Bob, throw that lightning bolt to me, and he sees the smoke going up, he's like, oh no, no, the smoke goes up, Oh, nothing happens. A few seconds go by. Oh, I'm still here. I'm still, I'm still here. A minute goes by. Nothing happened. I look at the priest. The priest goes, what's wrong with you, man? You can go home now. You're done. I look, oh, okay. He starts walking away. Looks behind his back. Looks up at the clouds. Looks to the east. I don't see anybody. Starts walking away. A few hundred yards. Nothing happens. Oh, maybe on my way home. To, to, to Bethel, something will happen. He's riding home, nothing happens. He gets home, his wife, his kids are still there. His property's still there. Oh my goodness. I guess God accepted my offering. I guess he took it. I guess it was, it was just a small blemish. I, yeah, you know what? That's, it's fine, right? Everything, everybody's here. Everything is okay. I did my offering and we're okay. And guess what, honey? I say 50%. We're going to Israel Disneyland with the family. <laughs> Man, what a deal. I am so financially savvy. This was such a great idea. Bob, Bob gets away with it. He, God must have accepted it. It was just a small blemish. Now, here's my question for you. What do you think happens the next time Bob goes up to Jerusalem to a festival? When he wants, goes to buy a lamb. He sees that lamb in the same category. 50% off. Slight blemish. Hey, didn't you buy from me last time? Here, I got another one for you. Oh, that's good, but you got anything a little cheaper? Uh, yeah, yeah, this one's got a, a real big bald spot over here and it's got a bit of a limp in the leg. Let me try that one. He goes, he offers it. He's a little nervous. Nothing happens. Wow. I, I guess God accepted it. The next time he goes up, give me the most crippled, nasty, smelly, completely bald, basically free lamb that you have. Because God will accept it. I've discovered something. As long as it's a lamb, as long as it goes bad, it can't be all that bad. It will work. It will be good enough. Hashtag dad jokes. Yes, I have two kids. Roll your eyes like my kids. See if I care. <laughs> and, and, and every year he begins offering these things, and the priest looks at it kind of like, oh, you sure? He's like, yeah, man. I know my Bible better than you do. I'm living in grace. Don't worry about it. And he's, he's offering these offerings to God over and over and over again. And, and there's this presumption in his heart that whatever I bring to God, he will accept. Nothing happened in my life. No punishment. No, no, nothing went wrong. God must be accepting my offerings. Now here's the thing. When the prophet Malachi comes along, there's a rude awakening for Israel. A rude awakening. And God tells the people, you know those lame, crippled offerings that you've been bringing all along? I want you to know something. I have never accepted. In fact, I would have been happy if one of you guys went and shut the doors of the temple so that nobody would come in and offer that junk to me. Right? I'd rather have no offering than that offering. And the crazy thing is, how many years, how many generations of families of Israelites going to these festivals again and again and again we're offering these leftovers, these scraps to God, assuming that God was accepting their offerings, when in fact, he never was. Brothers and sisters, this is my question for you, for myself, for all of us tonight. What are you offering God? Because God is a great God, and what he demands and what he deserves is our very best.
best. Our very, very best. But so often what we do is we bring our leftovers to God. And we assume that whatever we give him, he will take. God will accept our leftovers. Can you imagine doing that if like, the, you know, the, the president was coming over to your house for dinner, and I know we have a really political time right now, so you don't like, if you don't like the president, I don't know, the president of Canada, <laughs> Justin Trudeau, uh, the Queen of England, whoever, it uh, doesn't matter, LeBron James, somebody <laughs> is coming over to your house for dinner, and they, they knock on the door, or ding dong, and you're like, oh, LeBron, come on in, come in and sit down for dinner, and he sits down, and you go, hold on, it's going to be right out, it's in the microwave, hold on a second got a nice TV dinner for you. Oh, hold on a second. I got some leftovers here from last night as well. Let me pop that in the microwave too and give that to you. Would we do that? We would never ever do that. It doesn't matter if it's the president of Canada or LeBron James or the, the governor of, of Pennsylvania or the mayor of Philadelphia. It doesn't matter who it is. We wouldn't offer a guest, an honored guest like that, leftovers. But yet with God, we so easily do that. I was talking to this uh, pastor once, and he was telling me about this uh, woman who, who called him. And he got a phone call from this woman, and she said, Pastor, you know, um, I, I wanted to uh, know if you would like a furniture donation for the church. I have this furniture set. Uh, I've had it for several years, but it's, it's in good condition. It's nice. It's, it's usable, and I thought maybe you could use it for the church because I, I bought a new set, um, and, and I have no more need for this set, and I, I need to make some room in my house. Would you like it for the church? And, and I, I heard that. I was like, oh, that's, that's nice. It's a nice offering. And then this other pastor told me, he said to her, oh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that, but, but we don't need it, and, but thank you for thinking of us, and he hung up. And he was telling me about this story, and then he said to me, I hate it. I said, oh, uh, me too. <laughs> why, why? Yeah, I, I mean, I know why, but wh why do you hate it? And he said to me, he goes, why do people always think that God is willing to take their garbage? Why do they always think that? If that furniture was good enough for you to use, why don't you use that and buy a new furniture set for the church? But why are we in the mindset that God is always willing to take our garbage, our leftovers, our hand-me-downs? We, we do that. We so easily get into that mindset. We give our best to ourselves, to other things, to our family, to our friends, and then whatever we have left, oh God, here is my offering. Here is my duty unto you. Don't we do that? We do that with our, our time so often. Look, we, we in, invest in our education. We, we, we double major. We, we, we are out there in the clubs and the school. We get these internships. We invest in our education. We invest in our career. We're working 50, 60 hours a week, sometimes more. We go to all the socials to, to kind of, you know, meet people and mingle. We go to get these extra certifications. We get an extra degree. We think about what company we can go to and try to align ourselves to get into the right place so that we can move up and, and make the most of our career. We invest so much in that. We, we take our time to invest in our friends. You know, maybe you're one of those people who's like, I got so many friends, I got to keep up with all of them. You know, you want to, that's so unrealistic. You know, you know what I'm talking about? I got friends everywhere. I got to go visit them. They're in town. I got to show them around. I got to keep up with all of my 500 Facebook friends. 500 is low now, right? Like 1,000, 1,500 Facebook friends. I got to keep up with all of them. You invest all this time in your friends and, or maybe in your hobbies. You want to invest in that. Now, I don't know about here, but in the Bay Area, like woodworking is like real hipster now. You know, <laughs> Woodworking, real hipster. People getting into woodworking and all these different hobbies and, and, and doing all these different things. And then with whatever time we have left over, we say, God, here is my offering to you. My, my dad, he, he wasn't a Christian at this time, but he used to say to me, oh, you want to serve God? You want to be a pastor and stuff? Oh, uh, yeah, no. Um, uh, but how about this? Why don't you first just get a job, make money, Become stable. And then, when you're retired, 
you can go and serve God. That's great, God. So I can just spend the prime of my life investing in myself. And then when I'm 80, I'm going to roll up in my wheelchair to God and say, Lord, tap him with my cane. I'm ready to serve you. But that's so often our mentality in what we do. We do the same thing with money, don't we? So often we'll say, you know, especially if we're younger, maybe fresh grads or, you know, working in our first jobs, we, we, we're so excited about going to check out all the new restaurants that are out there. What's hot and new in Yelp? It's hot and new. I gotta go. We spend all this money on food, on shows and concerts and experiences, and then whatever we have left, we bring that to God. When we get older, the same thing happens. Oh my goodness, my kids are getting older. I gotta spend tens of thousands of dollars to send them to, to these nice private schools and I gotta get this nice car and we gotta go on these vacations as a family and then whatever we have left, we give to God. And then all of a sudden, after we've spent all our money on all these different things, we say, oh man, things are so tight. I don't have much that I can give to God. We do that. We give God our leftovers of our finances too. Same thing happens with me. I, I remember, so I got two kids, right? And um, I, I'm Chinese American, so a lot of times when we visit family or friends, my kids will get these things, these red envelopes. Right? In Chinese are called hongbao, these red envelopes, right? And basically what it is, it's, it's cash money. Chinese people know how to give gifts, right? Forget the gift card, just cash. Okay, that's the best. But then it's like, oh my God, my kids get so spoiled. They're like, my kids have hundreds of dollars now because of this. They're like, my, I go out with my kids sometimes, we're at a restaurant, they go, Daddy, I'll pay for that. <laughs> I, go, I go, this is bad. This is really bad. Daddy, I can buy that, I got enough money. I'm like, um, no, son, uh, I, I bought stock for you. You have no more money left, right? <laughs> but my, my son, you know, one time he opened up this red envelope and he took out, you know, money. He had like 10 bucks there. And I go, oh, Noah, that's great, 10 bucks. Um, you know, you should think about giving an offering to God from that. And I'm thinking like, oh, you can give a dollar or something like that. I want to teach him how to honor God, right? I'm a good parent. And then Noah, my sweet, sweet boy, he looks at me and goes, oh, Daddy, um, you know what? I can give God the whole $10. I can give this to him as an offering on Sunday. And then you know what I do? You know what I do? I'm a pastor, right? You kind of know what my answer should be. You know what I said to him? I said, oh, Noah, uh, you don't need to give that much. <laughs> the whole $10? You want to give the whole thing? How about you? Maybe you give, you don't know what you're doing. Maybe you give like $2 or something or three. You don't need to give the whole $10. And I look back and I, I think about myself, what am I doing? There's my son wanting to give God the very best. All of it. The whole $10 bill. And I'm there telling him, no, 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 son. You don't need to give him that much. Give him a couple bucks and you keep the rest. You don't know what you're doing. We, we do that so often. We do that with worship too, don't we? Listen, how often do you come into worship and you're singing and you're praising and then your attitude is, man, I hope that my worship, what I present to God, is acceptable to Him. Let me tell you something. If you are more concerned about the quality of the worship team than you are about the quality of your own worship, that's a problem. That's the wrong, wrong focus. Your mentality should be, our mentality should be, I'm coming in today before God, and man, I need to give him my very best. Whether the worship team is awesome, which it is, or whether every string breaks on Chad's guitar. Every single one. I want to give my very best to God. Is that our attitude when we come before the Lord? But you know, you may be there saying, can God, would he like reject my offering? I mean, isn't he my, my father? He doesn't... You know, how does that work? What do you mean? He's my father. Yes, God is your father. Absolutely. He will never cast you out. You will never be separated from his love. As I was talking about the first night, all of that is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean we can just come and give him whatever we want and think he's pleased with it. There's a difference with that. I love my kids so much. I love Audrey. I love Noah like there is no tomorrow. 
But when my daughter offers me half-eaten corn on the cob, I don't want it. <laughs> Trust me, you wouldn't want it either. <laughs> Parents, you know what I'm talking about. And if you eat that, you got real love. Because there's nothing worse looking and nastier looking than eat half-eaten corn on the cob. Just because I love my child to death, it doesn't mean I will take whatever junk they give me and be happy about it. Are we giving God our best? Is that our mentality? I, I, this applies in all sorts of ways. I remember at AMI Revolution, 2010, eight years ago, AMI Revolution, I was there, Pastor Young was there, and we were in a prayer meeting before the, the, the worship meeting. And Pastor Young was there, and he was like, oh, guys, come on, let's get together. Let's pray. We're going we're gonna, to need to really pray for the students and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, he's amazing. He, his eyes are always closed. He never bumps into anything. <laughs> never trips. I don't know. When I've tried that, I'm, like, talking to people, and I am talking this direction. You know what I'm talking about? He just knows where he is. It's a gift. And he was there, and he was like, all the pastors, guys, we got to pray, and let's pray. And you know how Pastor Jelly is like, let's pray, let's cry out to the Lord, let's, let's, let's give it all to God, and, and we're, we're all there, and we're praying, and, and stuff like that. And it was like an hour-long prayer meeting, and I had a slightly sore throat, right? My, so my, I, well, I wasn't feeling that well. And I remember there, and I was, I was praying, and then I felt my throat, and I was like, you know what? My, my throat kind of hurts, and oh man, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor, and... You know, I, I kind of need to conserve my voice. I mean, later on, what if uh, people want me to counsel them and, and, and talk to them and stuff like that? You know, I need to kind of conserve my voice. It's okay. God will understand. It's all right. I don't need to pray like that. Now, in that moment, I was convicted. I was convicted. And I said, wait a minute. Why do I always think that God will understand? No. God will won't understand. No, God deserves the very best of me. So I started hooting and hollering and praying and crying out to God and all this stuff and just praying, giving God my best. Now you may say, well, that's kind of legalistic. God can hear you anyway, don't you? I get that. I know exactly what you're saying. But in my heart, I was convicted because I knew what I was doing. And I always, I say that all the time, God will understand. You know what? Maybe God won't understand. Maybe he deserves my very best. And that's what I should give him. That's what I should bring him. We should stop assuming that God will accept whatever we bring and begin to bring our very best to God. Now, here's the thing. It's hard to give our very best to God. It's very difficult. Why? Because of our natural fear. Our natural thought is, if I give my very best to God, what's going to be left for me? What's going to be left for me? I love the story in the Old Testament of um, Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. If you know that story, Elijah's there and there's a, a drought, famine, there's no food, no bread. And this widow here is basically about to run out of food and she's about to die. And her son is about to die, too. And they're out there gathering sticks in order to make a fire and cook the very little bit of oil and flour that they have left to make some bread, to eat it together, one last meal with her son, and then die. That's how bad things were. Elijah, prophet of God, comes along to this woman, sees her, and says, excuse me there, can I have some bread? And the woman says, oh, sir, all I have left is this little bit of, of, of oil, this little bit of flour. I'm going to make one more piece of bread. I'm going to eat it with me and my son, and then we're going to die. You can see, obviously, we don't have anything to give you. Elijah goes, yeah, yeah, I know that, but, you know, God will provide for you, but first give me a piece of bread. Make some bread, give it to me first, and then you will have more than you need to supply for yourself. Can you believe that? Can you believe he said that? She said, I'm going to eat this with my son. We're going to die. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. Make me some bread first. And you'll, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Look, can, I don't know if you can see her face. Look at her face. 
this artist got it. Elijah's like, right here, give me bread. Give me bread, right here. She's like, you crazy. Look at her son. Look at her son, his face. You crazy, man. You old man, you crazy. Look at the sticks in my hand. We're gonna eat and die. He said, give me bread. You're gonna be all right. Give it to me first. And then you can have some bread. Ain't gonna be any bread left. Give me bread first and you'll be all right. What happens? Well, Elijah basically says, give me your best. Trust God. Give me your best first. And this widow goes, makes us bread. Trust him. Trust the prophet of God. Trust God and gives us bread to him. Gives it to God. And then the Bible says that her jar of oil never ran dry. And she had bread for her and her son throughout the famine until the famine ended. They would have died if they clung on to what they had. If they were tight-fisted, if they did not trust in God, when they trusted God and they gave God their very best, they lived. They experienced life. Isn't this what Jesus said in Matthew? When he said, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll wear, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What's he saying? Give me your very best. Seek me first. Give me the very best. The first, the first fruits of, of you, your time, your money, your heart, your, you, you, all of you, your emotions, your life, and everything else will be added unto you. I will provide for you. When you give me your best, trust me, I will provide for you. And later in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it's so powerful. In Malachi, he says this, when he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. What is Malachi saying? Malachi is saying, listen, when you offer the offering right, when you bring your offering, when you bring the first fruits, when you bring the very best to God, look, not only will God be honored, but God will provide for you. And he, what does he say here? This is amazing. He says this. He said, you will be provided for. And he says, put me to the test. Now, as far as I know, you know the Bible says don't test God, right? Don't test God. This is the only instance in the Bible that I know of where God says it's okay to test him. It's the only instance. He is that confident. He says, you put me first and watch. You will never be in need. I will open up the windows of heaven in providing for you, in blessing you. When you trust me and you put me first. We can actually test God in this. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outbless God. He will pour out his blessings on you. Now, please understand. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel here, that you give God a dollar, he'll give you ten, right? That's not what my son Noah was thinking, I give God ten, he's going to give me a hundred, right? That's, that's not what I'm talking about here, because Jesus makes it very clear. He said, you're going to be blessed, right? He said, I say to you, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Now, he's... That sounds like, you know, wow, I give, God gives me more. That could be like prosperity gospel, but he says what? With persecutions. With persecutions. So he's not promising us that life is just going to be walking down a road, smelling the roses along the way, and, and, and you give him, and God will just give you more material wealth, and you give him a Honda, he'll give you a Porsche, something like that. God has got the best trading program in the world. That's not what it says. He says he will bless you, and you will be first. You will be great. You will be blessed and honored. But it ain't necessarily with stuff in this world. But God will provide for you spiritually, emotionally. Maybe he'll give you stuff sometimes, but what he will give you is his blessing. He will be with you. And you will never, ever give and feel like, man, God has not provided for me. He's not been there for me. I gave, and it wasn't enough, and I died like the widow and her son. You will be blessed. What does it look like to give your very best? 
I want to give you a few examples of what it looks like to give your very best. Um, for one, it means investing in the kingdom of God as much as you invest in your future, in your career. Look, I, when I say give God your best, I'm not saying, hey, everybody cut class and go to prayer meeting. I don't know you think, well, I'm, I'm supposed to be a student, right? I got to study. I got to, I'm, I work. I got to go to work and all that kind of stuff. Are you saying I need to quit my job and giving my best means, oh, I got to become a pastor or a missionary? No, absolutely not. Anybody can give their best. Giving your best. Here's one way to give your best. Invest in the kingdom of God as much as you invest in your future. We, we spend so much time thinking about our future. How can I major in the right thing? Am I moving into the right field of work? Am I living in the right place? Am I um, in the right growth area? Am I in the right company? And we position ourselves, we invest so much to, to, to do well in our future. How much do you invest in the kingdom of God? How much are you thinking, what can I do in my life to become a better Christian? What can I do to better develop my spiritual gifts? What can I do to better discover my calling in the kingdom of God so that I can make the most of my life? Are we as invested in that as we are in our secular workplace, in our jobs? Are we invested in building deeper community with people in relationships? Are we invested in learning how to pray? Are we invested in learning how to read the Bible? Am I invested in becoming a better leader, in discovering my gifts, in, in, in going on missions to see what God is doing around the world? Are we as invested in those things as you are in your future, in your job, in those things? I tell you, we should be more invested. We should be more thoughtful about those things than we should be even about school and our job. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to separate the secular and the spiritual and all those things. No, we are called to be a Christian in the light and to do everything that we do in a way that honors God. But sometimes we just start thinking about this secular path and the way that the world thinks about it. But are we investing that much in investing in the future of the kingdom of God? It might also mean for financially, rather than spending all your money on that show and those restaurants and that new car and all this kind of stuff and vacations and then whatever I have left, then I will give to God. Maybe for you very practically it means setting aside what you will give to God first. Giving Him the first fruits. Giving Him the very best. And then what you have left, you make it work for yourself. For some of you it may mean something as simple as that. For some of us, giving God our very best means needing to say no to the very best things of the world. Sometimes the world wants to give us the very best things and, and then we don't have the ability to take the best things from God. You know, when, when me and my family moved out here two years ago to the Bay Area, there were, there were a lot of, a lot of um, things that made it really hard to come out here. I was a diehard New Yorker. I, I, I love New York. Uh, my family is in New York. My church of, of since 1999 is in New York. My, my, Christian, my spiritual family is out there. All these things were in New York. It was hard to move out there. But you know what else made it hard too? My kids' schools. My kids. My kids in New York, the public school system is a jungle. They made documentaries about it. It's really, sometimes a school that you're zoned for is not that good and all this kind of stuff. And it's really, really this jungle to try to get your kids into a good school. Uh, before kindergarten, they could take these tests called the, the gifted and talented test to try to get into these special tracks in certain schools and stuff like that. And in New York, this is, this is something that like all parents are like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you, you, you send your kids sometimes to these special classes in order to try to do well on this test so that they can kind of figure out these puzzle games and what's the next shape and all these patterns and all this kind of stuff. And all these parents do it because they want their kids to get into these good programs. And now here's the thing, you take this test, right, and you're scored on a, you know, 0 to 99 percentile. I don't know if you actually get a 0, but up to 99 is the highest score you can get. And if you score between a 90 to a 96, you qualify to go into the lottery to try to get into a gifted and talented class in a local school, in a school that has a class that is gifted and talented. So the others are regular and one of them is gifted and talented. If you score a 97, 98, or 99, you, you get a chance to go into a gifted and talented school. 
That means the whole school is gifted and talented. There are five of those in New York City, only five. And the entire school is like that. And those are like the, that's the gold mine, being able to get into that school. But it is so competitive, and there are so many students, so many students score a 99, and there are so few seats, actually, that if you score a 97 or a 98, you have no chance. You're basically eliminated because there are so many 99s. And out of the 99s, if you score a 99, one out of three will get a seat in one of those five gifted and talented schools. And then you don't know what school you're going to get in. Some schools are better than others and all this kind of stuff. And we were there, and we were sending Audrey to play these puzzle games. <laughs> go, go, play these puzzle games. Do, you know, try to understand this. What's next? What's next? Fold this paper. Cut it out. What shape goes in here? We're doing all this kind of stuff. We were at missionaries out in Shanghai for two years, from 2012 to 2014. And as we were there, and I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to be going back in 2014, and Audrey's going to be starting kindergarten, what are we going to do? The test is over there. I flew Audrey and Christine back to New York to take this test, take this puzzle game from China. I flew them back. It's like, go, it's worth it. Go fly back. And, and me and Noah stayed in Shanghai, just alone, so sad, waiting for them to come back. And then Audrey went, and she took that puzzle game and, and you know, did all these tests, and the kid goes into a room alone with this this proctor and goes through these questions and then they come out and your parents are like so nervous outside and they come out and we need to wait like three or four months to find her score and we're all waiting day finally comes in we get that email the score is available we go and we we go check the email and it's like what's her score is so nervous we're like clicking oh, it's got, oh my god 99 right we're like oh my god this is amazing she got a 99 yes thank you god thank you god we're like oh well only one out of three people get a seat in one of these schools. So then we had to basically wait and see if we actually got selected. And then the day for the lottery came around, and then we find out, oh my gosh, we got selected. We got one out, you know, one third chance. We got one of the schools. We're like high-fiving, and oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then we're like, oh, we didn't get the first choice school that we wanted. We're like, oh, this is an okay school. It's a good school, but we wanted this one. And then we waited over the summer, and some people reject, some people take and shift around. And then after another month or two, we got a letter saying, you got your first choice school. We're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Life is set. We're like Willy Wonka with the golden ticket. We're like, it's all free. It's public school. It goes through high school. We are set. We are set. We are set. We're never moving. We're never leaving this place. Oh my gosh, this is great. And then two years later, it's time for Noah to take this test. And we're like, oh, Audrey got in. I don't know about Noah, though. <laughs> he's, he's really smart, if you're watching. He's a really smart kid. But man, what if he doesn't get the same score and Noah takes the test? And you know, if you get a 97 to a 99, you get sibling legacy. You automatically get in, right? We're like, oh my god, just a 97. Please, just 97. And then the score comes back, and he got a 99. We're like, oh my gosh. We're like, yes, he, his sister can't even shove it in his face, right? They both got the same score. And we're like, life is set. And then. We were asked, consider coming out to San Francisco to the Bay Area to plant a church. And I was like, oh my God, no. <laughs> no. No. We had it all set. You know how hard we worked on this? This is the lottery. We hit the lottery. It's free public school. It's so good. And I don't know what we're going to get out here. And it was so hard because it was the best. It was the best free, best of the free that you can get in New York. And we struggled through that. We prayed through that amongst all the other things, too, that we would have to leave behind. And then we said, yes, God, we will, we will come out. And when we came out and we planted that church and to see what God has done in building this family, in, in seeing those baptisms, in, in seeing a place where God is working, I can look at that and I can say, wow, God, we, we gave up the best of the world in terms of school, but Lord, you gave us something better. You gave us spiritual joy. You're working through us. Kids are fine. School is school, right? Eh, whatever. And now I'm like, whatever. But God has given us something so much greater. The joy of being used by him. The very, very best that he wants for us. Maybe for some of you, you're out there, you're like, you know what? I want to give God my best, but I feel like I, feel like I don't have... I don't have anything to give. Life has been so hard. I am so beat up. I am so tired. I'm, I got two toddlers at home. I got a baby. I got nothing left to give. It's so difficult. Listen, 
the, remember that story Jesus said when that widow came along and, and, and they're at the temple and all these people were giving in large sums of money to the temple, right? And they thought, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big shot. And they're giving all this gold and silver in the temple. And this widow came along and it says she gave two small pennies, two small coins in. But it, but it said that's all that she had. It looked like nothing. It looked like nothing. But Jesus said, this woman, she gave all that she had. She gave her very best to God. She gave so much more than all those other people. Sometimes we don't feel like we have much to give. I, was, I heard this story from a pastor recently at, at, a, at a pastor's gathering I was at. And he was telling this story about a very, very tough time that he was going through in his life. Very difficult time. He, he had grown kids. He had three kids. And in his family, there was all this stuff going on. One of, one of his kids uh, was struggling with uh, substance abuse and, and just had to go into rehab. Uh, his daughter got pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, all these different things happened. And, and he, he was just at such a low point. He felt like his family, everything was falling apart. But he was the pastor of the church. And he had to get up on Sunday to preach. He had to continue leading the church. And he was like, God, I don't have anything left. I don't have anything to give you. He said, God, I'm like, I'm at like 20%. I have hardly anything left in the tank. And you know what he said? God told him. God said to him, hey, you only have 20%. But all I want you to do is you give 100% of your 20%. That's all I want. You only got 20%? Give 100% of your 20%. And he, and he said, yeah. And he went, and he was in the worst state of his life, but he went and he preached, and he took the 20% that he had, and he put it all out there for God. And you know what? God was honored by that. Maybe you're a parent, and your life is so crazy, and you have a newborn, and you have a toddler, you're like, man, I'm so tired. You don't understand. I'm not getting any sleep. I don't have any time for anything. I feel like I'm at 5%. I got nothing left in the tank. Give 100% of your 5%. And that will honor God. Whatever you have, you feel like you have nothing, you take what you have and you, and you worship God with all of your heart. No matter what you're going through, worship Him with all of your heart. If you're around people, say, this person that I'm hanging out with right now, even though I feel like I'm going through so much difficult stuff in my life, I'm going to fully listen to this person and love this person with all that I have left. That's all I got, but this person's going to get it. It's going to get my attention. Give 100% of your 10%. And that, I believe, is our best in those circumstances. And when we do that, God will bless you. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you can give your best to God. And God will bless you. Look, the world, the world will not understand. The world will look at that woman who took the alabaster jar, her very best, her life savings, and poured it out upon Jesus and say, what a waste. What a waste of her very best. But Jesus said what? She has done a beautiful thing. And it will be she gave her very best. Brothers and sisters, let us always remember that God set the example for us. When he gave his son for us, he gave his very best. He did not hold back anything. He gave his own son, the Lamb of God, without spot and wrinkle. And because of that, because of that, now, with the Spirit of God living within us, we can give our very best to God, no matter what your situation, no matter what you're going through. And God will bless you. Listen, you think, you think you're living your, your best life right now Be, because, because you did yoga this morning, had avocado toast, now you're living your hashtag best life? That is not your best life. When you give your best to God, you experience the hashtag blessed life. And the blessed life is the best life. And when you give your best to God, He will bless you. He will bless you. And you will experience the blessing of God in your life. Let's pray together.
Can we stand? Invite the worship team up.